Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT NoGov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today we have a returning guest, CJ. Uh, coming in from Florida, he runs profcj.org, P-R-O-F-C-J dot O-R-G. Uh, or you can also find him on the other um, website, dangeroushistorypodcast.com, which will also reroute you back to the original one. Um, and so he runs Dangerous History Podcast, awesome podcast, and he's on Facebook, Twitter, Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play under um, Dangerous History Podcast. And so it's Facebook, facebook.com slash Dangerous History Podcast to find him there. And uh, yeah, we're going to discuss, he did a, a couple of interesting uh, episodes on slavery. Um, is it history of North American, right? Yeah, I think, right? North American slavery, um, seven episodes. And then a fascinating episode with, uh, it was an inter interview with uh, Jim Coonigan on uh, the Milgram experiment, the Stanford prison experiment, and the Ash conformity experiment so uh, we're going to talk about those fun topics uh so cj thanks a lot for coming back on the show hey you're welcome good beer yeah yeah i uh you know i feel like i gotta get you back on every once in a while because your episodes are just too um fascinating <laughs> to not share with my audience <laughs> so um so yeah maybe um we'll start off with the slavery one, um, and I think, I, I forget the last time I checked it, but, um, so I guess you started, what, in the, in the 1500s, the 1400s, something like that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I talked a little bit about um, slavery going further back. I kind of briefly glossed over, like, ancient Rome and some of these other you know, earlier slave societies because slavery obviously existed for most of human history, but it's not the same thing from one time and place to another. So, you know, what it meant to be a slave didn't always mean exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the bulk of it started like 14, 1500s because mostly the series was focusing on the, you know, what, what people today most commonly think of when they hear the word slavery, which is the shipping of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic uh, to the New World to you know work on plantations primarily so you know that really got going 1400s was when the portuguese started to sail down around the coast of africa and they were the first europeans to really get heavily involved in all that stuff yeah i um it, it reminded me of the the um the video by stefan molyneux the truth about slavery um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you heard of that uh, or seen that, but it's a fascinating video, and it really, really uh, illuminated a lot of things for me when he when he made that. And one of the things that he he said, which really caught my attention, was that everybody um, 
you know, points to white Europeans, I guess white European Christians, right, um, as being the sole culprits for slavery in the world. <laughs> Whereas, as you mentioned, slavery has been with many cultures for a long period of time. And and even uh, a very little mentioned uh, slavery in um, in the Middle East, right? The uh, what was it called? The Trans-Saharan slave trade, right? And how how you know the, the, the one interesting idea with that is, or the interesting thing is that there is no thriving um, black population in the Middle East, as opposed to now there is an enormous black population in North America, right? And why is that? Because um, they practice castration and, uh, you know, really, really horrific things that basically prevented them from uh, procreating. Yeah, that was that was the the other slave trading route. Uh, the one route went west to the west coast of Africa and from there across the ocean. And the other one went, you know, eastward across the Sahara, um, ultimately to the Middle East. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't get into that one very much in this series simply because, uh, the series was was focused on on the American aspect of right. it, but yeah, yeah it's yeah, important. Yeah. yeah, no, no. I just wanted to mention that because so nobody really pays attention, or most people don't even know about it, which which is just fascinating to me. But also the other thing that that I remember uh, you mentioned in your series was um, how you know most people point to racism as like you know. Uh, you know, the reason that there's racism in this country is like, look at the slavery. That that means that people were racist against the blacks, right? The whites consider themselves superior. Whereas uh, when you actually look at what actually happened, it wasn't necessarily just white people that were trying to enslave black people. There were black people enslaving black people, <laughs> you know, and, and the whites couldn't even enter the continent of Africa because they would die from the harsh environment. So they actually had to um, hire was it like like mercenaries or warlords to actually um you know kidnap and and bring these people to the shores so that they can be taken to the new world right so it it was immensely um um dependent on blacks enslaving blacks yeah well slavery had already existed uh in africa um racism is not a necessary part of slavery it was a central part of slavery as practiced in the Americas, but it's not necessary to have slavery as such. So, you know, Africans had been enslaving other Africans. And, um, you know, if you go way back in European history, uh, back to, say, the early Middle Ages, there were white Europeans enslaving each other in a lot mm. of countries. Right. And, um, you know, you go way back, probably <clears throat> the worst form of slavery that at least that I'm familiar with, is the enslavement of Greeks by Greeks. And I'm talking, of course, about the Spartans enslaving the Helots, who were just other Greeks that the Spartans conquered. Hmm. And, you know, one of the most brutal and dehumanizing forms of slavery that's ever been recorded in history. And, you know, these are just Greeks enslaving other Greeks. So racism is not a necessary, um, you know, condition for slavery. It's just uh, one of the kind of somewhat peculiar features of how it operated in the Americas. Um, sorry, what was the rest of your question? No, no, yeah, I was just, yeah, just, just mentioning how you know people point to racism as like, oh, that's why it happened. Whereas what you mentioned and, and the way you described it was that no, actually, racism was most likely the afterthought, the reason, the the um, you know, after the fact. Um, justification for the enslavement. You know, we're doing it because we're better than them, whereas that wasn't really the original purpose. It was just about power. You know, you can have power over other people. Um, and then later it was justified with, oh, yeah, because, you know, what, what is that? Um, that, you know, there was old, an old science like that that uh, measured the size of the cranium and showed that there was the, the brain was larger and, you know, certain races. Was that phrenology or something? Yeah, phrenology. Right. <laughs> and And how... You know, they would use stuff like that to scientifically, in quotes, scientifically prove that the white race was superior. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I in most cases, I tend to believe that most people don't really have principles. What they do is pursue what's going to benefit their their own, mm. you know, position, their own material interests. And then – and I'm not even saying they're doing this consciously. In a lot of cases, I think they're they're not doing it consciously. They're doing it unconsciously or subconsciously where they sort of come up with very elaborate 
beliefs that are just sort of ras- rationalizations mm. and justifications for the beliefs that happen to also benefit them. So, you know, someone who works at Lockheed is very likely to favor a belligerent, aggressive foreign policy. Mm. And and I don't think that in most cases those people sat down and like worked it out and they're like, OK, you know, I want to make more money selling bombs, so I'm going to support – a more belligerent foreign policy. I'm sure they kind of feel like that just happens to be what they believe. And of course, Hmm. possibly there's also self-selection because a person who would want to go build missiles probably already is a certain way anyway. Hmm. But, you know, that it's not like beliefs are formed in a vacuum. There are material interests at play. And just most people are kind of unconsciously deceiving themselves. So, you know, it's not a coincidence that the more profitable slavery became, the more elaborate became all these, you know, racial theories and mm. all these things of saying, well, you know, it's actually a benevolent paternalistic thing. We're trying to educate and uplift and civilize these people. It's like, well, you, you're you're only saying that because the cotton gin made cotton way more profitable than it was, mm. you know, just a few years ago when slavery was declining in profitability. You were saying, well, this is kind of a bad institution that we should phase <laughs> out. You know, you can you can sort of chart the the ideologies hmm. just to just to pick pick on the United States. You can chart the ideologies of Southerners particularly Southern um, slave owners, based on how profitable is slavery in a given year. Hmm. And so at times when slavery is declining in profitability, you have even plantation owners saying, well, we really should come up with a program to phase this thing out. And then if suddenly slavery gets a new economic lease on life, those same guys are like, well, we can never free our slaves because it's an important educational institution. You know? oh, <laughs> this, is, this is a Christian charity project we're working on here. <laughs> charity, right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to untangle the exact relationship mm-hmm. between racial attitudes and the institution of slavery in the case, uh, the specific case of Europeans using African slaves. I, I try to dig into that. There's some great books out there that deal with this. And it's hard to say for sure um, kind of what the exact alchemy was that made things the way they were. But, you know, I, I think it it definitely makes it easier to – because to, to enslave somebody and to work someone and discipline them as a slave, you really do have to dehumanize them mm. in one way or another. And I think that having someone who is – physically, ethnically, very different from you in appearance and who comes from a very different culture that, you know, to your eyes is primitive and inferior and what have you. I think that certainly greases the wheels of making it a lot easier for you to do things that in any other context you would immediately, you know, not be willing to do because Europeans had obviously gotten rid of with the, um, with, with perhaps the exception of serfdom in Russia, which lasted quite a long time. Um, but in, in most of Europe, especially Western Europe, the, the countries that later um, were you know shipping the slaves across the Atlantic, these were some of the first places in Europe that way back in the medieval period got rid of white slavery hmm. and that were at the leading edge of uh, first reforming and then ultimately ending serfdom. And these were the places that had the most, quote unquote, enlightenment in terms of, you know, influence of, of, of things like the scientific revolution and at least having theoretical ideas of natural rights and whatever. And yet these are the same people that then completely threw all those things out the window uh, when it came to running their plantations in the new world. And so I, I think that that racial difference played a role by making it easier to have a double standard. Where you're like, of course, back home in England, we don't have slaves and serfs anymore. That would be barbaric. Uh, <laughs> but over here, you know, all the rules are upside down. So it's okay. Not only is it tolerable, it's good. Hmm. Right, right. And and also another interesting aspect of, um, of the series that you mentioned was that um, black slaves, well, Africans were not the only race or demographic that were brought as slaves, right? Um uh, what were the other ones like Irish and uh, I guess indentured servants? Um, yeah, right. And indentured servitude. Um, some of them were pretty horrific, and, and some of them actually uh, 
you know, some of them died not not even paying off their debt because the the conditions were actually slave like. Um, so can you can you go into a little bit of that? Yeah, and the book to read for a lot of a uh, a lot of the basics of of that story that a lot of people just don't know is a book called White Cargo, and I forget the hmm. authors' names. I think there's two authors of it. Um, but yeah, they're they're a huge percentage of the people that came over to a lot of the North American colonies were actually unfree. Now, you know, some of them were closer to being in a condition of absolute slavery than others. Mm. Um, some of the Irish in particular, especially uh, ones who had been rounded up in relationship to rebellions and things like that, basically were treated like slaves. With some of the indentured servants, it's a little bit different. It's not quite um, as bad of a position as being a slave, but it certainly is not what any of us would consider, you know, free, um, individual, a free individual with full rights and what have you. I mean, at best indentured servitude is sort of like temporary slavery mm -hmm. and yeah, conditions were horrible. So for a long time, most of them wouldn't live out. They'd have a, a, you know, basically seven years or something like that in most cases. And especially in a place like early Virginia, you know, your odds of being an indentured servant in those horrible conditions and making it seven years were not very good. So um, – and there even were some cases of of white slaves being sent to some of the Caribbean islands and being worked, you know, basically to death in a lot of cases. Mm. And you can just imagine, you know, a bunch of, of uh, very, very pale Irish slaves – getting sent down to Barbados oh. <laughs> and uh, being worked all day long on, on a tobacco plantation or whatever uh, in the sun. Right, I right, mean, right. how long are, how long is, is, are those sorts of people going to last in that climate? Mm. I mean, it's just, you know, not good, not good. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And then, and then, um, um, moving forward a little bit, you, when you talked about, um, you know, the civil war and the emancipation proclamation and then the slave slavery was done away with, but interestingly enough, um, the the conditions of the slaves sometimes worsened afterwards because of all the resentment that was generated from the previous slave owners, right? Uh, that um, sometimes, you know, I guess that, that was to start with the KKK and all the lynchings and all that, um, and and how, yeah. So so conditions were not necessarily better, and and also you, I remember you mentioned um, about how certain groups um, fared. Um, you know, certain groups came out on top more than others. So, so can you go into a little bit with that? Yeah, well, it the it's a complicated thing, and because when you say this, people think you're trying to defend slavery, which I'm not. Right. Um, and and neither are the in most cases very very mainstream historians um, whose works I was referring to in the series. You know, none of these people are defending slavery, but simply pointing out that it's it's a it's a great historical tragedy mm. that because of the way things worked out for a variety of reasons um, in America after the Thirteenth Amendment, that in a lot of cases the former slaves and and their descendants ended up worse off because mm. they were still seen as less than fully human by much of the population. Mm. They were still seen as as not deserving of of full basic rights, uh, despite what the laws and the constitution might say. And then you've got this added resentment of of the the white population, particularly in the South. And and the thing was, again, not at all meant to be in any way a defense of slavery, but one of the things about being a slave was that to your owner, you were a valuable commodity mm. that he would seek to protect. And while he certainly would discipline you for, you know, insubordination or whatever, um, he had a financial incentive to not be, um, to be excessive with those sorts of things, to not resort to draconian punishments too lightly. Not to say that there weren't individual masters and overseers who were uh, incompetent or abusive or stupid or whatever. But in general, the financial incentive was to protect your investment. And so um, as surprising as this might be, back before the end of slavery, most of the people who were lynched in the South were white people. Hmm. They, they were, you know, poor whites who committed crimes or were supposedly uh, guilty of crimes who were then lynched by angry mobs or what have you. And it was actually pretty rare other than in the aftermath of a slave rebellion uh, for slaves to ever be lynched. 
because that's that's somebody's you know property that's somebody's investment mm. uh, you know that's not that's not the way i would endorse to to protect human life from vigilante violence right. um, is to, to make you a slave to some powerful guy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was one of the side effects of of slavery that that they then, you know, they removed that by freeing the slaves and freeing the slaves is great. But then there was nothing to to take the place yeah. of of that incentive to then protect um, the former slaves from, you know, lynch mobs or whatever it is. And so in a lot of cases, it became more physically dangerous um, to be a black person, especially in a lot of areas of the South. But really, um, even in the North, um, a lot of people don't know the the real peak of the KKK wasn't the original Klan that existed for a while in the aftermath of the Civil War. The real peak of the KKK was the so-called Second Klan, uh, which was founded in the 19-teens, is actually inspired uh, by the original movie Birth of a Nation. And it peaked in the 1920s. And in the 1920s, the Klan had, I think, close to a million actual members. And there were chapters not just in the South, but in the North. You know, there were Klan chapters in, in um, places you wouldn't expect, in, in New York, in California. Hmm. It was quite mainstream. And that's also, by the way, when they brought in their, their hatred – to include not just blacks, but also Catholics and Jews and kind of, you know, non wasp furners in general. And um, that's also, you know, there was an uptick in lynchings during that time period as well. And, you know, when, when you read a description of one of these lynchings, it's just absolutely horrific. And, and it shows how you can end slavery, but if there are these deeply ingrained attitudes of dehumanization unfortunately the ending of the institution of slavery doesn't automatically erase the the legacy of those attitudes once they've become ingrained and like i said before now you no longer even have the fact of being someone's valuable property to potentially protect you from from violence so yeah i mean it was a bad deal i mean re reconstruction went very badly for almost everybody in, involved, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody um, comes out looking particularly impressive in terms of how they handled Reconstruction. I mean, the former slaves kind of dealt with it the best they could, and some of them did okay for themselves, and some of them didn't. But in terms of, you know, the the white Southern population basically just used the former slaves as scapegoats because they they couldn't exactly go marching into D.C. and you know attacking the White House. So they vent their frustrations on on vulnerable scapegoats. Um, the the Yankees, the carpetbaggers who came in and, and ran the South uh, for about 10 years after the Civil War, a lot of them were corrupt and incompetent and, you know, didn't really I don't know. I don't know what could have been done better, but but it certainly didn't turn out very well. So, um yeah, I mean, it was it was just a mess, unfortunately. And there's there's a pretty good book called Greatest Emancipations by, I think, Jim Powell. And his argument there is that when you look at how slavery was ended throughout the Western Hemisphere, not, not just in the United States, because a lot of times we get sort of tunnel vision um, just on the United States. But, you know, there was slavery throughout the Caribbean and Latin America as well, and in all those places – between about 1830 and the 1880s, it, it went away. And um, the, the main argument of greatest emancipations is comparing all these different emancipations in all these different countries, that the more violence accompanied the ending of slavery in a country, the more likely that country was going to not do very well um, after emancipation, you know, mm -hmm. there was going to be more racial problems, more racial tensions and so on. Whereas in the countries where slavery was done away with mostly or entirely peacefully, while, you know, nowhere did it work out perfectly, there tended to be less, you know, bad legacies than in places where slavery was, was, um, phased out as the result of large scale violence. In fact, only the United States and Haiti in the entire Western hemisphere had, um, huge amount of violence as part of the ending of slavery. Yeah, that's a really, really um, important concept to to 
to let people know, you know, because a lot of people say, you know, how difficult it was to let it go, and that, you know, so many people died. Was it like five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand people died in civil war um, for, you know, trying to free the slaves? But uh, but then you're like, you're like actually, <laughs> most countries, most nation states in the in the Western Hemisphere did not have a violent revolution, and they did so peacefully, and there was a transition. And uh, and it's like, wow, okay, so people don't have to die in mass numbers <laughs> to, to have a change of paradigm. Um, but actually, I, I want to ask you um, another interesting question, which is, um, so the institution of chain slavery was basically one giant um, government program, right? It, it wasn't a function of the free market, right? It was entirely... Um, you know, state run, state subsidized, you know, the legal system justified it, right? Um, sanctioned it and all that. And so, and so, um, I, 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 the way I look at it is like it was, it was imposed. And I guess the, 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 the more powerful, the more wealthy, the more well connected, um, embraced it. But for the most part, most people did not. Um, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, the way that that slavery was carried out in in America could be seen as a form of welfare to the wealthy, because it it ultimately was backed up by the state. It was the state that, at the end of the day, um, enforced the various slave codes, and it was the state. And in the case of the United States, ultimately the federal government that stood ready should a slave uprising get out of hand. And so, yeah, day to day, you know, uh, uh, either a master or an overseer of some sort would be the one day to day watching the slaves on a particular plantation, um, meeting out punishment for infractions and that sort of thing. But if you force the owners of slaves – to foot the entire bill for policing all of their slaves, keeping them all in their place, right. putting down rebellions when they happen. Slavery becomes unprofitable very quickly if mm. you do that. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is through taxation and some other means as well is you socialize the cost onto the population at large. Mm. And so in the case of just, just looking at the South, uh, they about – three quarters of white Southerners didn't own any slaves, not because they were committed abolitionists or anything like that. There's all reason to believe they were as racist as anybody else, but it was because they couldn't afford it because mm. slaves were, were very expensive. And so, and even of those white Southerners who did own slaves, most who did own slaves owned fewer than 10. Mm. And it was a very small, very elite group who owned the big plantations and the huge numbers of slaves. And so, what the small elite would do is to spread the cost out amongst the population as a whole. Now, you do that through taxes, part of which goes to supporting um, the kind of enforcement groups necessary to, to keep the slaves in their place. And in the case of the South, they even had something called slave patrols, which in most areas of the South, um, especially the areas where there were lots of slaves, every white male citizen – was supposed to serve on the slave patrol, which is sort of like a militia, but its main purpose was keeping an eye on the slaves and putting down rebellions and that sort of thing. And this was just an obligation, and it was um, generally not a paid job. It was just an obligation of, you know, you're a citizen of this county in South Carolina. All right, you got to do this much service. Hmm. And so that's another way they could socialize uh, the costs of slavery, even amongst the part of the population that owned no slaves. Now. And and then beyond that, of course, the um, even the northern population is to some extent subsidizing the enforcement of slavery via the federal government and mm. all the federal federal laws dealing with slavery. But how do you do that? How do you get, at least in the case of of the the poor white Southerners who don't own any slaves, how do you get them to not just grudgingly but very happily and willingly? Uh, pay for the enforcement of slavery? Well, the answer is you inculcate racist ideology in them. And you make them absolutely terrified of the slaves getting out of hand. You make them see the slaves as the threat and the enemy rather than the rich uh, plantation owner who owns all the slaves as being the, the main source of, of, uh, of problems. And so that makes them quite happy to pay in one way or another for helping to enforce slavery. 
um, because they're so scared of the black population that they're willing to potentially fight for the right of the rich guy down the road to continue owning his slaves because the alternative is, you know, the slaves go crazy, run wild and, you know, turn the place into Haiti or whatever the, whatever the, the you know, worst case scenario might be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really good point. And that's something that, um, I think in a lot of, um, debates, you know, volunteers and anarchists have with status is, um, is that, you know, slavery was, is what happens when you let the market free, right? Because people, it's just easier, you know, it's just cheaper. You just enslave a bunch of people and you force them to work for you. And it's just, and you save money like that. <laughs> and, uh, exactly what you said is no, actually it is very expensive to whip 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 a man to make make him work and then make sure he doesn't leave and then and then what if he escapes and what if he rebels and how are you going to protect yourself and all this stuff you know whereas what if you just employed him and paid him to do that work <laughs> how sure much, how much easier yeah I, I yeah if you're paying to enforce it out of your own pocket i mean can you imagine what it would take let's say you you had a, a very large plantation mm. with 400 slaves on it and what would it take for you to hire enough private security that you could actually get all those people to do whatever you want all the time and make sure they're not running away or, or looking to stab you when you're sleeping or, you know, I mean, it, it would quickly take the profit out of whatever the hell it is you're growing. But if you can kind of get the state ultimately to backstop you and yeah, you hire a few overseers to kind of, you know, run things day to day, but ultimately they, and even the slaves themselves one way or another know that, at the end of the day, there's an army behind all of this. So, yeah, I mean, you could you could do slavery in the absence of the state, but you couldn't do it on a large scale. You couldn't do it, mm. you know, to massive numbers of people for an extended period of time uh, with any degree of success. And and you go back to to ancient Rome. Um, you can go go listen to um, Daniele Bellelli's History on Fire. Um, I think it was his first two episodes of that show that were about the massive slave uprisings in Rome. Mm -hmm. And he talks about in there how much the Roman state backstopped slavery mm -hmm. and and was willing to take whatever drastic measures necessary. Because, um, you know, Rome had massive numbers of slaves. And had the Roman state and the Roman army not ultimately been behind all of all of the rules and everything regarding slaves, it would have been um, both unprofitable and impractical. And, and by the way, a, a great historian, and, and I don't I don't think he's particularly radical in his own i his own ideology. As far as I know, he's just kind of a mainstream historian um, who talks about how much slavery really is not a free market institution is Peter Colchin. And he's got a book, I think it's just called American Slavery. And it was a book I referred to a lot in that series. And he really eloquently uh, makes the point in a number of places that th there's this weird hybrid relationship when you're looking at American slavery, where on the one hand, the plantations really were plugged into a global market. Mm. They were producing commodities that were bought and sold and shipped around the world. They, A lot of the better run plantations, and by better run I mean more profitable, um, were run with all the discipline and regularity of a factory. They were, they were very organized, very disciplined, you know, everything um, run, run by a very tight schedule and whatnot. And so there's a lot of ways in which you would look at some of these plantations and go, wow, this is this is very capitalist looking um, in terms of, you know, it, it, it's run with all the discipline of a factory and they're very interested in efficiency and they're they're plugged into the global marketplace and all that. But as Peter Colchin makes very clear a number of times, and I think I quoted several of these passages uh, where he says this, he says, yeah, but at the end of the day, you've got this – this thing where on that level, yes, it's it's a market institution, but it's based on a non-market relationship, which is slavery. <laughs> so, you know, at the at the very base of the whole the whole plantation uh, staple crop system is an unfree labor situation that is not based on consent. It's not based on on voluntary mm. um, interaction and exchange. And so, therefore, it, it it'd be sort of like. Looking less far back in history, when the Soviet Union would 
produce stuff and sell it to the world. You know, when they produce oil or whatever it was and sell it abroad. Yeah, at the point at which they're selling commodities into the global marketplace, they're engaged in market activity. But it's not like it it was free organizations and free labor and so on mm. that is producing these commodities. It's a bunch of enslaved Soviet workers who really aren't free. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a point that deserves to be emphasized a lot because you're right. I've heard it. Um, you know, a number of different places where people are like, oh, well, the free market gives you slavery. <laughs> um, well, at the point at which slavery happens, you could make the argument that the market is no longer there. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, wonderful uh, talk about slavery. We'll uh, definitely link to your episodes in the show notes. But um, let's change gears and talk a little bit about your other um, episode with Jim Coonigan. Uh, about the Milgram experiment, um, and yeah, this is a this is a fascinating experiment about um, obedience and o obedience to authority, an authority figure, and um, and basically, um, as I understand it, I think Stanley Milgram did it in response to the um, the Nuremberg trials, where the a lot of the uh, the SS soldiers gave the excuse, well, I was just I was just obeying orders, you know, just doing my job, and um, millions of people died. Um, and, and he was like, how can that happen? You know, these pe are these people really that evil, you know, and, and, you know, do regu can regular people do such heinous things if they were just, uh, told to do so by an authority figure? And, uh, and so, yeah, so fast. So what, what are some of the things that you gleaned from, from that, um, learning about that experiment? Yeah, well, I knew the basics of it, but it was nice to talk to Jim cause, um, he's, he's much better read in, on, on those experiments than I am. And he actually has a background in psychology and psychiatry where, you know, I'm an interested amateur. I like reading about those sorts of things, but you know, I, I don't have the same amount of depth of, mm. of uh, knowledge and research on those things as I do with history. And the, um, the, the Milgram experiment, I think Milgram actually was the child or otherwise related to either Holocaust survivors or Holocaust victims, I forget which, wow. which which made him particularly interested in this question. Mm. And the idea was you, you would have someone being brought into an experiment and they thought the experiment was about learning. And the idea was you'd have the quote-unquote teacher who was actually the test subject of the experiment on one side of, of a glass panel and then a learner on the other side. And the idea is that the teacher is supposed to shock the learner if a learner answers a question incorrectly. Now, in reality, the quote-unquote learner is just an actor who's in on the experiment too. And he's not really getting shocked. He's just acting. He's pretending to get shocked. But of course, the, the so-called teacher, who's the real test subject, doesn't know this. The, the teacher believes that he's really shocking somebody when mm. he gives the wrong answer. And as the the learner gives more wrong answers, the teacher is supposed to up the ante in terms of how much he zaps the learner. And then, of course, the, the learner acts more and more injured. Um, at one point, even says something about a heart condition and really starts to get uh, distressed. In some cases, they even had the learner um, pretend to pass out, like just pass out entirely right. some people even kept shocking the learner after the learner had appeared to pass out right. uh, now they did so reluctantly and most of the time the the teacher the the real test subject the one doing the zapping most of the time was showing signs of distress most of the time was showing signs of reluctance but in, in a surprising number of cases and i forget the numbers off the top of my head they were willing to keep escalating the pain they were inflicting on the person on the other side of the glass um, simply because a guy with basically a lab coat and a clipboard and, you know, the kind of notion of being a faculty member of a prestigious university tells them the experiment has to keep going on. So there's um, there's 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 troubling elements to that, of course. There's kind of scary things as far as how much people will obey authority figures, even if they're doing it reluctantly, even if they're clearly uncomfortable. Um, but there were some hopeful elements as well, where it, it showed that, um, you know, in, in certain circumstances, people would um, stand up against it. 
And one of them was, and this is repeated in a number of other experiments that deal with sort of conformity in other ways, that when you have someone else on your side, you're more likely to do the right thing. Hmm. So if there's someone else in the room who, who is, who is also an actor, but who's pretending to be another, um, another, you know, teacher in the, in the experiment, if you have an actor go in and be like, I'm not doing this, this is wrong. It's more likely the other person will suddenly, you know, grow enough of a spine to, to (laughs) take a stand as well, which, you know, on the, on the one hand, it's kind of depressing. On the other hand, it means there is, there is some hope, right? you know, um, I don't, I don't think most people are psychopaths, but I, I think that, um, a certain percentage of people will do what a psychopath tells them to do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, it at least provides us some hope to think that if enough people do start to take a stand, um, against obeying authority when authority is really ordering them to do something heinous, that, that there could be a potential force multiplier effect where other people who might otherwise have gone along with it might say, oh, to hell with this, I'm not doing it, it's wrong. And, and I think we can see some real life instances of this as well, um, particularly around like the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, fall of the, the communist bloc in, you know, 89, 90, 91. There were cases where soldiers or security forces were ordered to fire on on demonstrators and whatever and um and they chose not to and they chose to actually you know go join the demonstrators against the government hmm. so you know there there's little gleam there's little gleams of hope to be found um despite the fact that a lot of it's kind of downbeat also there there was another study based off the milgram experiment where they showed that people who score their personality scores as like very friendly and agreeable are, are the ones more likely to do what the authority figure says. Mm. And the people whose personality is listed more as like, you know, cantankerous and contrarian and that sort of thing. <laughs> those are the people who are more likely to not push the button on you. Wow. So yeah, it's the kind of, you know, more tough to get along with people <laughs> might be the ones who won't pull the, pull the plug or push the button on you when a guy with a clipboard tells them to. See that? <laughs> so the guy that pisses you off at work, you should really uh, make friends with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, some weirdo like me um, <laughs> is going to be the guy who's not going to do what he's told um, just because he likes to be contrarian. Right, right. See that? The uh, the contrarian always wins out. But, um, yeah, one thing that I I, uh, I took away with is kind of interesting because uh, I think you mentioned this in uh, – yeah, you, you went in, in uh, about tribalism and conformity in your episode on 21 key um, concepts, I think, right? Um, And you were saying how, you know, that's a very ancient and very deeply instinctual um, tendency for human beings to want to conform to the group. And maybe before, when it was really vital for survival for you to conform to the group, that was necessary, right? But now... Um, it's not as vital in the sense of life and death, and but still we retain that fundamental instinctual primal urge to do so, and how how destructive that can be, um, and yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Like it brings up the idea of um, you know are are human beings um, essentially good or bad, right? And uh, and and I guess. Depending on who's asking the question or, or who's thinking about it, you can come up. You can answer both ways. You can see, you see, they're they're willing to do horrible things as bad people, but but actually, yeah, I tend to to look at it, I guess, the way Jim does, which is um, that the people that are that were obeying, like you said, the agreeable ones, they they just didn't want to make waves. They didn't want to make problems. They just want to get along, go along to get along, and so they, <laughs> they, which is kind of you can look at it like that's kind of pretty bad, but then again. It's nice that they're trying to they're trying to um, you know mitigate tension and conflict, but but you know the fact that they're committing horrible <laughs> potentially horrible things we got to work on that one. But yeah, so <laughs> I think yeah. it, it, it kind of shows that that humanity or people want to get along. You know, people want to trade. People don't want conflict. You know, war is not a natural uh, a natural outcropping of the free market, and and um, you know people don't want to be aggressive and and um, violate other people's consent. Like, that's not something that most people want to do, right? Most people just want to earn money legitimately and raise their kids and, 
and uh, have a good life and teach their kids how to good life. So I think that's kind of one thing that I take away from. Yeah, yeah. And to me, it, it's like this this impulse gets hijacked by the leaders. You know, that like to me, that's that's what ends up happening to this impulse for you know, kind of tribalism and getting along with the society in which you find yourself. That's not necessarily negative in and of itself, right? I mean, you can imagine a scenario in which you live in a society where everyone's rights are generally respected and there's, mm. you know, kind of widespread belief in, in aggression is wrong. And, you know, I'm sure there would be people who wouldn't go along with those norms and, and who would have to be dealt with. But in a society like that, if you want to conform, that's okay because you're basically right. conforming to leaving people alone right, and right, right. treating people with respect. Right. Um, because one of the things is that human nature clearly is above all else malleable. Mm. And it, um, I forget where I first heard this, but I, I think it's true mm. that it's sort of like, like liquid you pour it into a container it takes on the form of the container and so, you know, should it surprise us that most people who are born and raised in Saudi Arabia shockingly become devout Muslims, you know, I mean, <laughs> should it surprise us that most people who are born and raised in North Korea think uh, Kim Jong-un is the man? I mean, right, right. you know, happy that would, that would be any of us, or at least most of us. And, and those of us who didn't, didn't conform to that, if that was the situation in which we've been born and raised, um, we'd probably find ourselves taken out of the picture one way or another. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't exactly be uh, reproducing much. Um, you know, might, that might be it for our genes. And so, you know, it, it it's not necessarily a bad thing that most people want to just sort of go along and, and um, you know, take the path of least resistance. Mm. The problem is when you have these, these um, societies and cultures and institutions and things that are not geared towards respect and, and respecting people's rights and not being – not aggressing on others and that sort of thing. Then it becomes a problem because then people are going along with a system that does bad things. Right. Yeah. It's uh. Yeah. It's definitely a good point. Um. So so let's uh let's move on to the the Stanford prison experiment, and I I remember there's a there's a movie made about this I think with Forrest Whitaker and uh, Adrian Brody, and um yeah I was thinking about that when I was listening to you and Jim talk but. But yeah, it's also another fascinating um, psychological experiment about the nature of power and how it can it can corrupt people. And it's not just that um, it's not just that power um, corrupts, you know, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what's also I think important to realize, uh, and I repeat this often with people, is that power attracts the corruptible, right? It it it's a magnet for those people that want. Um, to subjugate and dominate other people, right? Um, which is fundamentally why I am an anarchist, and I assume <laughs> you are too. That uh, you know, it, it's it's like we're not just against Obama and Bush and Clinton, and you know those people. You were against the idea, you know, the idea of somebody ruling over um, millions of people, and how idiotic and nonsensical and barbaric that is. So um yeah so 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 go into a little bit about the Stanford prison experiment and and uh and what you what you glean from that. Yeah, I think this one's probably the best known of these kind of big experiments because yeah there have been multiple movies based on it. There was um the Forrest Whitaker one a few years ago and then more recently there was one that was actually very closely based on the true story. It, it had a guy um, playing, oh shoot, blanking out on what? What's the Zimbardo? Philip Philip Zimbardo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they actually had had the the characters' names pretty much the same, and it was like very closely based on the real history of them uh, doing that in the like some abandoned building on the Stanford campus or whatever. And yeah, and, and this one they tried to control uh, for what you just mentioned the. Um, the tendency of power to, to attract those who are already corrupt or tend tend that way uh, by by sorting they, they had these volunteers these college students volunteer to uh, take part in a psychological experiment and then they sorted them into prisoners versus guards and they did it basically randomly they didn't do it based on anyone volunteering to be either and so they even more or less minimized that whole aspect that the the guys who became the guards hadn't 
hadn't been able to choose to be a guard. They just mm. were assigned that. Right. And they were given um, very little training. I think they were given some some kind of little uniforms and um, something that, that I've always found interesting in a variety of places, mirrored sunglasses. That there's there's something about wearing shiny aviator shades that block your eyes from oh, people oh, looking oh, at you. Oh, oh, you mean the ones that, that, that cops wear all the time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, my, my brother refers to those as douchebag glasses. I, I don't know. Really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, well, they, I was wondering why they wear that. <laughs> yep, they they play a part in this experiment, oh and <laughs> I think there have been other experiments too where they've shown that little things like that, wow. little things like wearing those sunglasses that that conceal <laughs> your eyes, so the other person can't see can't see your eyes, it actually does affect people's attitudes wow, and their yeah. behavior and their willingness to be jerks and authoritarians and whatever. Mm. Um, I, I think I also remember reading somewhere else that um, when someone gets in a uniform that's all black, hmm. it tends to also make them more, you know, gung ho. And of course, <laughs> calls to mind the SS, it calls to mind uh, the modern day hyper militarized law enforcement, mm. you know, people in these these all black tactical get ups, you know, right. they suddenly want to be Rambo. Right, right. But um, <laughs> so so they made half the half the uh, experiment subjects prisoners, half of them guards, gave them a few basic rules and instructions and then kind of let loose. And it was within, I think, less than a full day that the guards were starting to get very abusive and they were starting to have serious problems and the prisoners were starting to have all, all kinds of problems and breakdowns and um, wasn't long before there were, there were hunger strikes, there were people getting tossed into a closet for solitary confinement. Just all these horrible things started happening and they ended up having to cancel the experiment early hmm. because it was getting so out of hand. It was actually um, – Philip Zimbardo's girlfriend who just came in to see what was going on to visit him, hmm. who basically got into an argument with him and eventually convinced him to stop the experiment because Zimbardo was getting sucked into the whole kind of role playing drama himself. You know, he was sort of part of the experiment and watching the experiment at the same time. Hmm. And it, it shows you how quickly power does corrupt, even when it's, you know, something that everyone you would think everyone participating in this thing knows it's just role playing mm. and yet not only did the the guards internalize their position and become abusive jerks very fast but the prisoners internalized their position as subservient and you know as as, as kind of victims of abuse they internalized it very quickly as well and and started acting accordingly and um one of the things that i, I thought was very interesting that uh, Jim was talking about on my show that I really hadn't known about was he said that the the guards sort of broke into three groups in terms of how they behaved. Hmm. And there was um, uh, there was one group who were the real like jerks who wanted to act like the warden on Cool Hand Luke and all these sorts of things hmm. who were punishing the prisoners for imaginary things and whatever. Then there was a group that weren't really abusive, but they just wanted to do everything very strictly by the rules. They just, you know, wanted to stick to all the instructions to the letter, even if it didn't make sense. Mm. And then the third group were, was the group that was trying to be decent to the prisoners, that was, you know, trying to bend the rules when they could and help them out when they could and did not actively participate in any of the real bad abuse. But on the other hand, the the, the quote unquote nice group of guards also didn't do anything to stop the other guards mm. when the other guards are being abusive. And so um, Jim was telling me that what would often happen is when, when really abusive things would be happening, the guards who were the sort of nicer guys would just conveniently not be around. They, they would mm. just kind of, you know, <laughs> just like, Oh, I'm going to go on break now. I'm going to go uh, over here. Uh, um, and, and in our conversation, I, I mentioned to Jim, it immediately called to mind um, a lot of real life examples of that sort of behavior, right? Where, yeah, are there are there some cops who don't, you know, go over the top abusing people and whatever? Sure. But on the other hand, they never seem to be around to actively stop the cops who are doing mm. really bad things, you mm. know. And and you see that in any sort of um hierarchical institution where there's a lot of authority and domination and top-down relationships where you know, the the people that are the decent ones relatively speaking, 
they never seem to, or very rarely, I should say, seem to actually stand up to and stop the ones who are the real, you know, sadists, the real, um, you know, bad people on a power trip. Yeah, definite parallels with uh, <laughs> with law enforcement right there. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's amazing that uh, you know when you do talk to um, you know law enforcement about about the idea. You know, it's like some people ask law enforcement, if you were in um, you know the early twentieth century, would you enforce Jim Crow segregation? And they said, yes, I would. Sure. <laughs> You know, and uh, man, it's just it's just amazing the amount of um, I mean, the, the 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 way that they're able to completely turn off their humanity just because they have convinced themselves that they are a mindless machine, just told just being told enforce this, enforce this. Um, but but what's interesting about that is that. Even still, even if they are, even if they do convince themselves that they're a mindless machine, it's kind of impossible that they enforce all the laws. Because I mean, you know, a simple conversation with law enforcement, and a lot of a lot of uh, anarchists and volunteers are more well versed in law <laughs> in, in the laws <laughs> than the law enforcement themselves, and they can actually school them. And and yet um, that may prove to be a problem because you know trying to, trying to school a, <laughs> a police officer <laughs> in, his own, in his own field does not always have a pretty outcome. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's made worse by. You know, I have no idea how common this is, but stories have come out of some police departments and things deliberately screening out um, applicants who have high IQs yeah. and deliberately screening out applicants who seem to have a really strong independent code of code of ethics. So and, and those have been upheld by courts as being legitimate employment practices of law enforcement agencies like, oh, yeah, it's legitimate. You don't want. Um, enforcers who are too smart or too independent minded or who seem to have a strong independent code of morality. Like, of course, that that should be a legitimate reason to not hire someone to be a cop or whatever. I mean, which, which I, what else do you need to show you mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. it's not what you think it is? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that this notion that, that there are all these noble altruistic people who, who just want to protect people. Yeah. Well, if if that's the case, then then why wouldn't you want to hire the most moral, the most intelligent, the most you know, mm -hmm. honest, uh, upright sort of guy, right? Interesting. Um, related side note on this topic. <laughs> I was talking to a female friend of mine recently, and she said um, she was telling me about like the idea that. Um, you know how women a lot of women have this fantasy that they like men in uniform right and i and i asked her what what kinds of uniforms exactly do you like <laughs> and she's like she's like oh police officers soldiers <laughs> and i'm like okay you just named two government <laughs> jobs now is there a, a man in uniform that's does that's not a government job that's a fantasy she's like i don't know <laughs> and, and i'm like all right take a take take the, take the police officer how about the private version of that how about a private security officer? how about a mall cop does he is, does that turn you on at all and she's like no that doesn't do, <laughs> that doesn't do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably the only one I could think of would be a professional athlete, but you know, other than that, and or maybe construction worker. I actually that, that could be one. <laughs> I could see yeah. that. But it's just yeah. kind of funny that when 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 you know, in that case, you know, they talk about men in uniform. Uh, where, where was I listening to that? Oh yeah, this other this other YouTube channel I follow, Infinite Waters, really inspirational guy. And he was saying that you know women like men in uniform because they, it it tells them that they have a sense of direction. But um, but in this case, <laughs> uh, it's kind of strange that that she only mentioned government jobs, and I thought that was very very interesting. Um, it, it's like I guess it's like they like to know that they. Oh yeah, she was telling me because she knows that they have power. That's one thing that that you know I guess some women like, which is you know it just gives you an insight into the way the you know I guess the female mind, some female minds work. Yeah, yeah, I could be I could be misremembering this, but I'm pretty sure I saw somewhere 
that uh, police officers and soldiers have some of the highest rates of divorce and highest rates of, you know, alcoholism and other family dysfunctional problems and whatever. So it just shows you, I mean, if you were looking at this rationally, you you would you would much rather have a guy who's who's a welder, you know, right. or, or a guy who works construction, or a guy who whatever, right? Um, because statistically, it's much more likely he'll he'll be a mm-hmm. a better, more stable, long term, uh, uh, you know, mate for you. But right, right, higher rates of domestic abuse, just just violent, yeah. violence in the household, and and you know, just looking at their job, it's like, of course, just it just makes sense. They have completely separated their their mind and body they, they've become like a shell of a human being you know they they sure it's like they've they've discounted their morality their moral compass altogether so um yeah it's not really altogether shocking when you when you consider it like that um but um you know we're running a, a little low on time so uh, i don't know you want to talk about the ash conformity or w- would you like to save that for another time yeah well i mean i'll just i'll just briefly mention um this is probably the less the least well-known of, of these three experiments. And it's one, I only found out about it a year or two ago, I think. And it's just showing how people can warp their perspective into not believing their own eyes. If people around them are saying something different than what they're seeing. And so anybody listening, just Google this. It's Ash spelled A S C H. And the um, the psychologist was Solomon Ash, and the Ash conformity experiments. If you just Google that, you'll probably find it. And people, in some cases, seem to have known better, but chose to give the wrong answer to questions because they wanted to go along with the group. And in some cases, people seem to have actually had their own perceptions be warped by their their unconscious desire to conform which it just it just goes you know yet more um support for this idea that most people are hardwired to just sort of go along with the group yeah actually one thing i wanted to mention was that um you know how you were saying that uh it's not necessarily a bad thing right because you know depending on where you live and where you grow up you know you have you know being able to conform maybe actually just save your life and and I wanted to say, even though a lot of anarchists and voluntarists are quite the contrarians and um, enjoy being the oddball out, um, I think it's interesting when when we get together, like Pork Fest and you know Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest and all this kind of stuff, how happy we get to to be with other people that think similar to us. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's nothing again. There's nothing inherently wrong right. with um, you know, liking to be around people who are similar to you in one way or another. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Trekkies wanting to go to a Trekkie convention, right? <laughs> or you know, whatever it might be. You know, right. Star Wars people going to a Star Wars thing. Right, right. It's it's when that tendency and and it yet again served a purpose. Back when the whole human population of the world was a few thousand people and we were in these small little hunter-gatherer groups always in danger of extinction with like less than 50 people in a little group or whatever, there's something to be said for very strong group cohesion and all that. It's it's a simple evolutionary survival mechanism. But we don't need that anymore to mm. just to, to get by and a lot of these impulses are counterproductive and they're so easily hijacked by those who wish to rule that they've they've become counterproductive and dangerous in a lot of cases you know there's nothing wrong with with people saying oh we're fans of the same sports team let's let's go watch the game together um but when it it turns into just rejecting rejecting obvious uh facts and um you know, being willing to potentially do bad things in the name of your group, which really means in the name of your leaders. You know, every, everybody thinks, oh, I'm, I'm going to go fight for America. Well, you're really not. You're really going to fight for a small group of oligarchs who've decided that there needs to be a war over someplace. You know, right. you're, you're right. not fighting for the group as a whole. Mm-hmm. But of course, the the elites are are more than willing to let you think that so that you don't realize, oh, I'm going to fight for a handful of rich, powerful people um, who want a war. So. Oh yeah, it's the age-old argument of you know it's very important to separate the idea of of culture and the state or society and the state. <laughs> Everybody conflates them as being one. Sure. 
Um, but yeah, awesome conversation, CJ. Uh, really appreciate it. So before we go, um, I know I asked you this last time, but I asked this of all my guests. Um, please uh, give me a quote that's uh, been on your mind lately, like one of your favorites. Mm, lately. All right. I might have to think for a minute to <laughs> come up with a good one. Um, hmm. This quote is actually from William Athelman Williams, who was kind of like a um, early New Left American historian. Mm. And this is from his book, America Confronts a Revolutionary World, 1776 to 1976. And he said this about the Civil War. Put simply, the cause of the Civil War was the refusal of Lincoln and other Northerners to honor the revolutionary right of self-determination the touchstone of the American Revolution. The act of imposing one people's morality upon another people is an imperial denial of self-determination. Once begin the process of denying it to others in its own name, and there is no end of empire except war and more war, end quote. So that one's been coming to mind lately just because I've been grappling with all of the complexities of the Civil War as I work on my series that uh, as we're recording this is going to be starting in the next few days. Wow, awesome. Yeah, definitely the um yeah, the Civil War, the not so Civil War, the War of Northern Aggression. Um yeah, definitely a very interesting one because that's I guess that that is one that the that you know, we learn a lot about in government school along with the Honest Abe. <laughs> very interesting uh very interesting name for him. Um it, it, I think uh I remember you saying how how interesting it is that the the presidents that we venerate and respect and are like considered you know it, it, it accepted in the hallowed halls of our of our government school are the ones that have killed the most people or that they, they have people have been killed under their administration. Sure, uh, right. <laughs> the highest body count usually gets you way up on the list. Right, right, definitely. But uh, but yeah, awesome, awesome conversation, CJ. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks a lot. I, I think um, we will probably be having you on again because I'm sure you're cranking out some fascinating content. And uh, there's always something awesome to talk about in the Dangerous History podcast. So thanks a lot, CJ. All right. You're very welcome. Been my pleasure. If anybody wants to help me out, uh, you can do so through Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. Links are below. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. Um if you if you if you enjoy this show, please feel free to patronize it. Provide value for value. That is the capitalist way. Um, you know, like all people, we respond to incentives. So um, if you enjoy listening to these conversations and you want to help me produce more of them, um, please exchange value for value so I can interview more fascinating people like CJ here. <laughs> so awesome conversation, CJ. Thank you very much. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and voluntarism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening.
I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the BitCot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.